You're listening to the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. In today's publishing landscape, you can reach fans all over the world. Query letters are a thing of the past. You don't even need a literary agent. There is nothing standing in the way of making a living from writing. Join two best-selling authors who have self-published more than 20 books between them. Now, on to the show with your hosts, Autumn Burt and Jasper Schmidt. Hello, I'm Jesper. And I'm Autumn. This is episode 111 of the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. And uh, I always like these uh, episodes on the craft of writing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's all about the seven steps of story structure. I'm looking forward to this one. Actually, I have to confess, we have a seven steps of story structure t-shirt that I designed and I was in the other hey. other day and I was like hovering over the button going, I want to buy myself one. Well, maybe for my birthday. I kind of want to get it. Nice. So I haven't gotten it yet, but I am still getting one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. There's actually quite a lot of uh, nice things, both t-shirts and there's also <laughs> some mugs and yeah, coffee, you know, tea yeah. cups and whatnot. There are. They're fun. I definitely need a smaller, I need a little assortment going on. I mean, it's stuff I did, so I have to get an assortment, but I haven't yet. Uh, my traveling life t-shirt would be a good one, I think. Yeah, true. Yeah, you can find <laughs> it on uh, amwritingfantasy.com, by the way, if anybody's interested. But uh, yeah, there's a whole assortment of all kinds of stuff you can <laughs> you can get with, uh, with nice writing uh, branded stuff. Uh, well, whatever you would like, yeah, almost little gifts and things. Well, yes. No, maybe not, but, but the, yeah, <laughs> nice, nice things. All right, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to this. But yeah. uh, I know first of all that you have had a terrible <laughs> week <laughs> or weekend. I shouldn't be laughing, but it's just so <laughs> horrible that you have to you have to find the humor in it. You do. If you don't laugh, sometimes you'll just end up as a little puddle on the floor crying. But I feel so cursed. I actually just wrote my niece and said that, oh, because I'm writing that story, The Tainted Fae, and I have a dark fae. And I know, I just, I don't know how it's going to happen if I'll work it into the novels I'm about to release before I release them. But I just have this scene where he is cursed and everything he touches starts to like go round, wrong like you can almost feel like you're in a mouse trap and you realize suddenly you're in a mouse trap and you can feel the strain that it's about so something you're going to touch is going to explode the whole thing's going to go like crap and you just have to sit there and be like why am i cursed what did i do how do i get out of this that is my life right now so i it's going to become a great scene in my story but right now oh my god i feel like i'm got to I feel like I'm going to break something much worse than I've already broken so many things this week. Like my laptop. Yeah. <sighs> so deep breath. The yes. laptop that uh, just uh, breaks down is like my worst nightmare, to be uh, honest. I mean, Jesus, it's horrible. It you is. Have everything on your laptop. <laughs> it is. It's my life. I mean, there was that moment, like literally, and so that listeners who haven't been part of the conversation, the email chain between us, I literally was, was working. I had my book file open. I was working on a cover so for my next release. Um, so I had Photoshop open. I had my editing notes open and I just went to unplug the power cable and the whole screen went black. Just poof. Mm-hmm. And it was that, n- 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 no, just no. I mean, the three things that you would not want to lose, not to have open on your computer when it dies. It was, no. But yeah. this is not my first computer death. Um, it's so, I, and I've definitely learned over the years. I, the first time something ever happened, we've talked about it before. I actually lost 10 chapters when I used to write on my iPad. Yeah. And so the next time when I lost my Mac Air when we were traveling and living a vagabond lifestyle, that hurt, but I only lost three days of data because I was really good at backing things up. But this time, you know, I, again, I, I use iCloud. I knew after that moment of holy no, when I'm trying to get it to turn on and I'm sitting there with my head in my hands, just <laughs> leaning over it going, what have I not tried? What else can I do? I am not going to panic. What else can I do? And I thought, you know, the files are fine. I keep all my book files are automatically stored. They don't even touch my hard drive. They are stored in Dropbox, 
backup files are stored elsewhere. I do snapshots on Scrivener. And then when I do really big updates, like finish a novel or finish an editing session, I put the main file on an external drive. I <laughs> have my book files everywhere. And so if everyone, anyone, if I ever become famous in JK Rowling's, I am screwed because I have to, so many places I've got to protect my files. <laughs> but I do it so that the moments where you realize that your entire everything you were just working on is gone. You, I can go, that sucks. I might have lost five yeah. minutes of data. I was putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was. And like I said, and what's the worst part is that literally this week, even just I'm currently borrowing my husband's laptop. He's been my knight in shining armor, keeping me from going absolutely crazy and letting me borrow his Mac. And so kicking him off into some old Dell that's, you know, relegated to the back corners usually of the house but it's i've touched so many things setting up his i've just been like updating my photoshop brushes and then i lose wi-fi connectivity just talking to you i went to do something and finder just shut down on me for no reason i was just making a folder and it disappears i we have a little water pump that runs battery i went to use that the other day and i touched it and it just died. <laughs> My husband touches it and it works fine. I'm like, come on. Yeah. This is not even funny. <laughs> I feel and so you, cursed. You, jo you joined this uh, recording session here and your <gasps> microphone wouldn't work. <laughs> it's no, just like, no. oh my God. <laughs> I literally feel cursed and I don't know what I did, but I will definitely, definitely feel like you know, one of the Fae in my story that they are just totally cursed. And my one character always feels like he's cursed. And I feel like I am just somehow became him. And it sucks. <laughs> well, that's karma for you because now you can try to live the life of one of your characters and feel what it's like all the shit you put them through. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna, I need to make amends, put out some honey into a dish outside or something. I don't know. But yeah, so yeah, right. Life... Next chapter where you're really, really nice to them and everything goes smoothly for a chapter or two. And then maybe they'll lift their curse. Maybe it's the characters. It could be. I will try that because I am at my wit's end. <laughs> they are Fae. It would be my luck to have pissed off the Fae. So anyway, how is your life? It can't be this bad. No, not not that bad or even exciting as as, you, <sighs> as, as it is on your end. But I, I think, given what you've been through, I, th I think I, I can live with that. I can live yeah. with a bit of boringness on my end. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's very similar. I guess uh, we're still partial lockdown here, and mm. I don't want to talk more about that. So, uh, no. but the good news is that uh, I'm approaching the final few chapters of our first short story in the in Elysium, in the world of Elysium. So that's pretty yes. cool. That is so cool, and I was so on my way to catch up to you this weekend, but you know, <laughs> I'll get there this week. I hope, <laughs> barring yeah. other disasters. <laughs> yeah. No, <it's> <laughs> But yeah, yeah it's so... funny because a long time ago, I read in a story that there was a curse, and I believe it's a tribe somewhere on this planet, but the curse is literally, may your life be extraordinary. Because if it is, if you were the one chosen by the gods, just like if you're mm -hmm. chosen by a character, you know, in a novel, if you're one of the heroes, your life sucks. So <laughs> I'm so happy you've had a normal life. So one of us has to. Yeah, indeed. And uh, we also got a Facebook group started for our readers for the World of Elysium. Uh, we, we'll add a link in the show notes uh, to that group just in case anybody listening are interesting, interested in that. But the reason why why I mention it is more to say that it's quite fun, you know, when, when well, you create uh, something new like this and this uh, Facebook group is new mm -hmm. and there's just... So few people in there, very, very little engagement. It, it's like a whole new world. And it's, it's, I think it's fun to sometimes you remind yourself on what it was like also when you first started out and you had no audience, you know, it, it's <laughs> cathartic in some way, isn't it? <laughs> it is, except I feel like I might have touched it. That's <laughs> what happened to it. So I don't oh, know. No, yeah. no, it's, <laughs> it's not my fault. I know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I think... Uh, 
I think it's quite nice and uh, healthy as well for once in a while to because you know we have the Am Writing Fantasy Facebook group and That's that one has big. so much engagement and so many people also joining every single day. There's a new batch of people joining. There's a lot of awesome posts, mm-hmm. a lot of great stuff that people are posting and helping each other with and so on. And then you, you go into the, <laughs> the reader's group and it's just crickets. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, just night you and, and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's uh it's it's quite fun, but of course I mean over time we'll try to build that one up, and so that's going to be very engaging and fun as well. But I just uh, I don't know I, I just thought about that today, and I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> A week on the internet with the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. So before your computer crash, Autumn, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you actually managed to uh, finish up two logos for Elysium. I did, which was exciting. And yes, I was about ready to work on other things for Elysium, some maps, but I was, and I did more than we did. We've gone through how many drafts of logos, but we found two that we like. So that was exciting. Yeah, indeed. And so we, we're actually going to post them to our uh, reader list, email list, and ask them to vote for the one that they like the most. Because uh, the, that's really the reason why I mentioned it is more to mm-hmm. say that uh, I think stuff like this, it, it's good to make a reminder for yourself to, um, to get some input from other people. Because yes. the authors themselves are not always the best judges on... Which in this our case here, uh, it's a logo. It could also be a book cover or something like that. But we're not always the best judges of uh, which one is the best one. So um, yeah, just leverage your email list for that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I mean, plus it gives the readers, it makes your readers feel like they're important. They get to be part of the decision. And yeah, this is like your focus group to ask your readers like, hey, which one do you like? This is This is perfect if they like it and they'll see things that maybe you don't because you're so worried about something more particular and they're going to come with fresh eyes and not know the story, not know the history, but they're going to feel that immediate connection, hopefully to one of them, even though I still have my favorite, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeed. We'll see how, what the votes uh, say, but uh, yeah, indeed. And, and it also of course builds some anticipation uh, about the future writing you're doing when you do stuff like that. So I do th- encourage people here listening to uh, try to think if there's something you could share with your list, uh, something that would, uh, it doesn't have to be directly uh, something, you know, it doesn't have to be an extract of the actual writing. It could be something like this, like a logo or maybe some artwork or something uh, of your setting, but something that teases a bit and builds anticipation of of maybe the next book you're writing. Uh, I think that kind of thing is always good to do. So uh, yeah, but on to something else. I also noticed how Keith posted in the Am Writing Fantasy Facebook group. Uh, we talked about that a moment ago as well. <laughs> so there's a lot of posts in there. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I just picked one here that uh, because he he's outlining a new series and he asked for tools or resources to help him organize his world building. And I always love the world building questions. And I suppose <laughs> yes. that's why I picked that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. I just think it's incredibly useful again here when you can ask other people for inputs and advice. So in our just before, it was with our readers list, but here it's asking fellow authors for their advice on uh, on what they use for taking world building notes. And he got a lot of suggestions on that. Oh, I'm sure he has. There's been actually a few threads on there recently with tons and tons of comments, which are, it's just awesome to see so many people helping each other out. Though I did laugh because there was one who is, I can't even remember the test that he mentioned, but he was like, hey, does anyone else ever use this sort of, basically it's a reader level test. Like, are you writing at fifth grade level? Are you writing for 13th grade? And I had to look that one up. I'm like, oh, that's why when I was in high school, they always said I read at an advanced level. It was this test. Okay, so <laughs> mystery solved from something in high school. But yeah, you know, sometimes there's less pu- less comments on a post, but it was very interesting and made me go look it up. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And I, he, that was one of the suggestions he, he got on this world building uh, post was, well, mm-hmm. the, the, a lot of people are using spreadsheets. Some are u- using Google Docs. World Anvil was mentioned. We know all of oh, that, yeah. but there was some somebody also mentioned Campfire Pro. I'm not aware of that one. Oh. Do you know what that is? 
No, I haven't looked at that one. I'll have to definitely, because I know as I build the Elysium website, we've been talking about how to make it a link to like almost an encyclopedia of our world. And I'm looking yeah. for plugins and methods of doing that. So I'll have to check out Campfire. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah. But maybe some, uh, maybe that will be inspiration for for some listeners here as well. If, you, if you're looking for ways to organize your world building, we do have a lot more options or no, let me say a few more options uh, <laughs> or different options in the world building course as well. Yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, when we open that later up in this year, We'll let you know if you're on the email list so you can get onto the email list from amwritingfantasy.com. So we will let you know in, in case you are interested in that. Absolutely. And on to today's topic. So, Autumn, <laughs> seven steps of story structure. This, when I found the seven steps, I can't remember how or where I found it, but it totally changed it me it was a light bulb going off and how the writing and story process worked nothing else had worked for me before but this i was like oh, okay and so i've been a huge fan for well i mean i realize next year will be 10 years of self-publishing so considering how long it took me to write my first my debut novel i've been writing for over 10 a decade now so yeah this this <laughs> totally changed my organization in my story outlining so yeah before going into any of the steps and so on um, oh yeah it may be high level why why do you think it made such a difference oh i think i think a lot of people are taught in high school or even writing classes you know i have my undergraduate in uh writing in English. And a lot of them teach the three acts process. And it to me, that's way too broad. It doesn't have a progression in my mind. It's more of a static framework because in each of those three are broken down into three. And it feels more to me like slots, like a picket fence, like this is just how it looks. But this is literally a story progression plus not only is each step built on the next one to create a flow, once you realize how it interlinks with the character arc so that the character are more or less all the plot stems from the character's actions and so the character arc gets tied to the plot and it all becomes this massive weave that has a definitive flow and an input that comes out to a totally different output and you're like oh I have a whole story and it makes sense. It's not um it's not linear so much as a lot of loops, I guess, and that's probably how my brain works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um uh, well, there is like a million ways of uh, structuring stories and and everybody can find their own way through it, I guess. Um but I also like how uh, well, how each of the steps are getting in, it's it's more granularly, it's more specific, and I like that rather than, you know, very broad high-level strokes um, yes. where you don't really any way understand what, I, what am I supposed to put into those three steps or three arcs. And, and I know, I think I've heard somebody also talked about nine arcs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and I've heard of a five act structure too. And that one, I haven't, it's not as popular. I haven't seen much on it, but especially to me, the three acts, so many writers get stuck. We call it the muddy yeah. middle, the mushy middle. They get stuck in the second one. This one doesn't have, you know, it has a second, but the middle, it's so definitive and it breaks it down so clearly and then it also gives you a chapter guideline, like how much should it be of the novel so that you know how many chapters even should be in it. It just, it's like giving someone a map with clear instructions on how to go from point A to point B or Z. And you know all the stops along the way and how long each of those stops are supposed to take. And it's just like, oh, there you go. I can get mm. there. I love yeah. that feeling. Yeah. So where do, where does, where do we start? Well, I guess we could start with the intro. <laughs> That's where you start with your novel. <laughs> yeah, so, that sounds good. Yeah, so the intro of the seven steps. And technically, there's one in there we'll talk about that it's not officially a step because that would make it eight. But this right. first one is the intro. So that's the introduction. And it is, I like to call it the way I the way we teach it in the Fantasy Writer's Guide, 
is that this is sort of a mini story, an everyday moment that you go and you meet the character and, you know, all those things that people tell you, it should be starting with action. Don't, you know, do too much. Don't do info dumping, all those things, all that happens in those first initial pages of the intro, which is, I believe it's like 10% of your entire novel, one to three chapters. I know for me, I, especially when I'm writing a series, the first book might be up to three chapters, but a lot of the time, you know, this is a one or two chapter and then I get to the next phase. But mm. that's the, I, I like to get the, th- I like to get things going really quickly. But other times you like to ease in yeah. with a couple, like three chapters of your introduction. No, uh, yeah. And I think one of the things that is really good with this is that when you think of it as a bit of a mini story, mm-hmm. so just, you know, stretching a couple of chapters uh, and that's it, but that, it forces you to sort of try to build a bridge between the, let's call it the day-to-day or the ordinary world that the character lives in Mm -hmm. to whatever's going to happen in this story, right? So so you're sort of building a small bridge there between um, going around doing your day-to-day job (laughs) almost (laughs) versus something something is going to happen and you're going to get pushed into into the story. Um, But because you have a bit of length to work with here and, and you have some, let's not call it rules, but guidelines on on how 10% may be a couple of chapters long. This also forces you to get to the point. Yes. Um, I, I think I mentioned on a previous podcast episode that, and I'm not going to mention names here, but I, <laughs> I was reading a book a while ago where honestly it was like, I think 15 chapters or something. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, very little happened other than we were following the character and he was going about his day-to-day things in, in the village he lived in and, and stuff like that. And mm. It was like, yeah, okay. He had a bit of conflict with some other boys that were teasing him and stuff like that. But it was like, mm, okay, but 15 chapters is just like, it's enough for you to put the book down. That would be um, enough for me to put the book down, assuming that they, yeah. were, they were more than a page long. No, no. And some of them were really long chapters oh, as well. My. Um, I, I only managed to read it uh, to the end because I was doing it for some market research for, for because for us. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was why I was reading it. But honestly, I mean, when you have a bit of guidelines saying, keep it short, uh, build a bridge between now and for what comes next, mm-hmm. then yeah, you are forced to, to make it interesting. And you also can't waffle about with all kinds of other things because then you, it's going to f- take up too much space in the in the novel. Um, and at least then you are not following the guideline, which of course you, uh, yeah, again, I don't want to call it a rule, but there is a reason why there's a guideline on it. Absolutely. And especially, I mean, going with the idea of the mini story and starting with action, you know, the best way to do it is to basically have something going wrong in the characters every day, but it's minor. Like it's like a normal everyday hiccup. I think before I've used an example of like, you know, the the little shepherd girl is supposed to be going to school and instead the goats have gotten out. It's her fault. So she's got to go get them. And that sets her off somewhere else. And that is the introduction. You get to see a little bit of her world. You get to see a little bit of things going wrong, what she's supposed to be doing, where she wants to be. You get a feel, an emotional feel, as well as a physical action feel of what is going on in this character's life. And it's a hiccup. I mean, it's goats getting out. It is not, you know, the orcs raiding the entire village. It's just a little problem, but it's a normal problem that the reader can relate to, even if you've never herded goats before, you kind of get the idea that you're not supposed to let them out and getting in trouble as a kid and that you're supposed to be going to school. And yeah, you get those feelings. You relate really quickly without getting worried about the what the heck is going on? Who is this person? Those little questions. Yeah, the other part is as well that it gives you the possibility to build that likeness for the main character. You know, if you can, you can show them in a small, like everyday situation where they're doing something nice for somebody or they're helping somebody. They maybe they're you know taking care of an animal or just something that will start building that. Um, relationship with the reader or, mm-hmm. or that likability towards the reader so the reader feels like ah, oh, i like this person this is yeah. a nice person right you want that, that emotion you, yeah the connection yeah, that emotional connection there and build that right from the beginning that's good yeah yeah 
So all of that leads into the inciting incident, which is when you're really starting to introduce the bigger plot of the novel. And now this one is, this is quick. This is one chapter. It happens and it's boom. And it is when you flip the character's world completely upside down. And that's why it's so much fun. And it's really, it kind of starts off the whole story plot, the big plot. And this is where you've introduced the reader so they feel familiar with the character. And this thing happens and they're like, oh my gosh, how's this, how's this character that I've started caring about going to get through this? And so it's so much fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> There's not much else to say. I mean, the inciting incident is the inciting incident, right? But, it uh, is. Well, I, I think a I, good way of looking at it is like if you have that mini story, this is the outcome of the mini story. And whatever that outcome is, it's not what the character expects. It is like, it is the opposite. So you go to go find your goats and you know, either the whole village is swept up into an armed raid while you're gone, or she gets abducted to a fairy world. Something happens that is not the normal every day anymore. Yeah, and, and you get to see the um, that there are bigger things at play. Yes. Uh, I guess that's a good way to put it. Absolutely. Mm. So where do we go in step three? Oh, this is... Always. This, so now we're starting to technically get into the middle that in the three act structure is where I would always get lost. So this is the next phase is the reaction phase, which like the name of it, this is where the character reacts to what just happened. And it's so easy to mentally when you usually get to the middle and you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. I need to throw in some hurdles, right? I have to throw in some lulls and I don't know why. Well, this tells you, okay, these this sec next section, which, oh, I'm trying to think about 20%, maybe 30 to 30% of the novel. It's usually like five to seven chapters, depending on how long you draw it out. I think a smaller reaction phase is better than a longer one, because this is literally the character reacting to their world being thrown upside down. So they're going to be probably overreacting. They're not going to survive unless they have help or luck. And there's only so much time you can draw that out where your main character is flailing on the point of failure before the before the reader is like, oh, please get a clue. Just get a clue. So <laughs> this one is, yeah, I like this one on the shorter side personally, but that's how I write. You can make this one as long as the next, next phase. So two phases from now. And the character incompetence also shows here, right? So you, yes. you can show how the character is really not equipped to deal with the situation at all. And they're probably going to fail uh, and stumble <laughs> through uh, through things. And then that's also, uh, well, we can talk a bit about character arc a bit later here. But okay. but that's where you can start showing the, well, the beginnings of the character arc, meaning that the, this is where the character is failing. And then later on, when you start seeing that the character is succeeding, then you can s start seeing the chains there. Absolutely. And you can see that the character has gained new skills and new knowledge and is getting better or stronger or whatever it is that uh, your story is about. Um, so it, it seeds very well in character arcs with the story structure uh -huh. in itself. It does. I mean, this is basically the character wants things to revert to the normal every day. Even if they thought they hated the normal every day, there's this longing where they realize, I'm not prepared for this. This is this is much more real than I thought it was. Um, and so they're, they're stumbling around, and that is the perfect b basis for a character to grow, to either want to return to what things were, to have the wrong view of the world, to just have everything show that they are a novice and a newbie and not who they thought they were or even thought they could be. And yeah, that's the beginning of a character arc. Yeah, indeed. And this is also where they most likely will sort of try to hang on to the, well, the lie that they're telling themselves about the world that, uh, you know, that they will, they'll try desperately to hang on to their understanding of the world and say, no, uh, th this is how it's supposed to work. And I'll continue down this road of how it's supposed to be, even though I'm banging my head against the wall all the time, but I'm still going to try because I'm convinced that this is the way things are. Um, and, and then again, later on with the, with the character arc here, later on, once they start realizing that, 
maybe there's something with myself I need to change as well to be able to succeed. Again, then you're starting to show the change in the person and, and it becomes a, well, the character becomes alive. It becomes more than a cardboard, uh, cardboard uh, carve out that, the, <laughs> that is all living on the page. I mean, it, it's, it's three dimensionally all of a sudden. Absolutely. Yes. I think that is a great way of putting it, that this is, it makes the world so much in the arcs and the story is just really becomes this deeper topic. Yeah. And then we move on to what step four now. Step four. So this is one of my favorite. It's often called dark night of the soul or the new info phase. I, I love the idea of the dark night of the soul. This is like, the treachery, you know. Cool. Yeah, it just sounds cool. It's just like, oh, this is like, you know, you you failed so badly in the reaction phase. You've held to that deep belief, that wrong view of the world so strongly that you've caused like the death of your best friend. The fail someone's captured dead. And you have that moment of waking up or staying up all night going, Holy crap. I screwed up. I have to admit that when I do my writing, if I go back and look at all of the ones, I tend to do a new info, which is a new a new piece of the puzzle. New information clicks into place and you suddenly go, oh, crap, that's what I needed to be doing. And this is the truth that I didn't realize before. So you can do it. It depends on if you're into the dark fantasy, a dark story or a more of a novel, a noble bright, which I tend to write noble bright by myself. So I tend to have more of that. Oh, this is where I'm supposed to be going more than I have the, Oh, you just died. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the evilness always yeah. comes out in the end. <laughs> it does. Yeah. I have this every once in a while, I write a really dark one, but you know, it's usually not there, but, and this is another one that is also just 1% of the novel, one chapter. You just have one moment where this happens. You don't draw it out too long. You make it, emotionally impactful whether it is light and a new info or dark and death and despair and just that horrible sleepless night of realizing you're a total screw up and you've caused a serious thing to happen one of those two you just get through it and move on it's sort of it is, in a way it's a lull it's a reaction as well to something that just happened so it's not an exciting chapter but it's an emotional impact and this is the second turning point of the novel when the inciting incident it's funny all the turning points are just one chapter the inciting incident one chapter mm. first turning point this is the second turning point one chapter dark night of the soul well, it is an exciting chapter. It's, it's oh, just not action. I think that's what exactly. you mean. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's yeah, there's no, usually no battle scenes during it unless it's all kind of gets conglomerated in there. But it is definitely just an incredibly impactful chapter. Okay. And after that, we move into step five. Step five. So now this is the other side of the coin from the reaction phase, which was the character flailing about and screwing up and nearly dying if it wasn't for luck and friends, we're in the planning phase now. So this is the character set coming out of that dark night of the soul or coming out of the new info phase going, this is what I need to do. And I'm going to make this plan. I'm going to get this person to help me. I'm going to go get this talisman. I am going to go and do something because they are seeing the bigger picture in the world. It's not just about them. You know, this is where they're working with the character arc, where they're going from, I had this false belief to going, this is the real problem in the world. And it's not about me going back to what I want, but it's about me solving this problem for everyone who had the same problem I did. and. It's kind of, it's so dynamic. Again, this is the middle where so many authors get lost and suddenly you're saying, you know, 20 to 30% of your novel, five to seven chapters, the planning phase. You know, you can make it a little bit longer if your reaction phase is really short, but this is where things are starting to click and the tension starting to build. This is where the villain is starting to take notice directly of the hero. And so things, every single hurdle that they come up against is getting bigger and bigger and now the main character is starting to win some on his own or her own, starting to make progress, which is making them much more of a threat. So the cycle, the tension starts really ratcheting down. And this is such a fun phase to write. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the middle doesn't sound boring anymore now, <laughs> which is a very good thing. <laughs> Definitely. Um, 
And you're also sort of at the point of no return at this point. You know, the character is starting to understand that, okay, I, I just, I can't just ignore this stuff. And I can't just go back to where I was and, and take care of the goats <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, I have to do something um, to, you know, whatever. Well, in epic fantasy, it's often to do with saving the world and stuff right. like that. But it, it could be all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, This is I like that the point of no return. At this point, they have kind of realized they are moving towards a definitive what will be the climax. They are realizing that they have a bigger problem to solve. And maybe every time they try to find it, they're finding more roadblocks, whatever it is to make the hurdles make sense in your world. Where a lot of the reaction phase hurdles can often be like environmental, like, you know, they're not prepared for the cold, the wet, the rain, the distance, the food, something like that. This is getting much more specific where they are going after people and henchmen and dragons, whatever they're doing. These are the really kind of bigger and bigger and bigger battles. Mm. Yeah, I like you just mentioning dragons. There. That's, uh, <laughs> I had to slip that's that good. in. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> okay, but then we get to step number six. We do, and this is where I do, um, maybe it's 5.5, so it's not really a phase, but there's something called the decision, and that is the bridge between the planning phase and the climax. And so this, in its own way, is this, the climax is big, and the whole novel is leading up to this, but the decision is a moment where the character realizes, maybe I'm scared, I didn't ever expect to get here. It's kind of a looking back at everything they've done, looking at what's at stake. You know, they're gone from caring about, you know, fighting three lost goats to trying to save the world. (laughs) And you kind of make sense of that. You have that moment of a deep breath of, I might die, but this is worth it. I am doing this. I am going to go fight this sucker. And they make that decision. And that is really important. It's sometimes only a paragraph. But that moment is a really good moment because it kind of lets the reader take a breath and also understand how big and important this is. And then we move into the climax, which it's again, a 20 to 30% of the novel. This is the five to seven to 10 chapters. This is the big to do where everything happens. The battle, the villain and the hero have to meet. They have to hit head to head. And how that happens is what's going to happen. That's all the climax. And it's often, you know, the 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 intro part. Well, no, no, maybe not step one because I think a lot of people fail there as well mm. in terms of understanding, building that little mini story in the beginning. But at, at least if we take it from the inciting incident part, that part people usually do not struggle with. Yeah. And also here with the climax, in most cases, people do not struggle with that either. But it's it's the step in betweens that are difficult uh, most of the time. So I think when we're talking about the climax. In most people or most writers, e- even inexperienced ones will feel fairly okay with this part because this is this is probably most likely the stuff you had in mind already when you decided the story in the first place that you wanted to write. A lot of the times you have a feeling of from the beginning where you want things to end up and how there's going to be this massive battle with all the dragons and, <laughs> and the fighting goats and uh, roasting goats. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, the dragons and the goats are going to be an interesting one to go against yeah. each other. I hope they're on the same tide. You, you never know. <laughs> no, indeed. So, so yeah, uh, I agree. I think most people have an idea of the climax. I think the biggest word of advice is that you have to make sure that everything that happened before the climax makes it worthwhile. You can there was a show, and now I'm trying to remember, of course, because my brain is so fried, but she was a, a succubus. And it was a really good story and character arc and magic and fey. But the battle scenes, the climax of the series of the season was always crap. They had like mm. this huntress who was so, you know, had been alive for a thousand years and had fought all these battles. And she died by like missing the bad guy with one sword stroke. I'm like, come on. Literally, <laughs> my right, nephew yeah. could write a better climax. So make this one is important. Everything that came before should make sense. And it's sh- the climax has to overtop them all. It has to be this level of tension that, you know, readers are gasping and they can't put it down before going to bed. And if you haven't gotten that, go back and rewrite it because 
this is an important step. This is what you know, everyone's been waiting for. And if you serve mushy cake instead of like this amazing, you know, baked Alaska, it, people are going to know. <laughs> <laughs> True. And then we came in to come into the final step. Yes. Uh, step seven. And this is one I think I do a lot of authors do miss and mess up or just kind of skip. And that's the wrap up. And it sounds so simple, but it's important. One, it's important if you're going to have a continuing series, you want to introduce the next thread, maybe even the next inciting incident at the very, very, very end. But you need to take the energy of the climax give your readers a quick breath, give them an idea of, you know, how people are faring, the love interest, wrap up those subplots. This is the emotional ending often of the story. This is the, that last taste, you know, a sip of wine. This is the last taste that's going to linger in their minds, on their lips when they shut the page. And it's either going to be making them, you know, look nostalgically forward and put it away forever, or is it going to get them ramped up to want to go grab the next book? Whatever that emotional ending is, this is you finish that in the wrap up, be it one chapter to three. This is again, it's, it's like a mirror image. You can almost fold the seven steps in half and uh, they mirror image each other pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well. But the wrap up is like the intro. It's just a quick little story. Yeah, and it's pretty cool when you can do a bit of a callback to the intro. Uh, Absolutely, uh, and and it ties everything to together in a neat little bow there. That that's really nice. But uh, I was actually gonna st- maybe step into a bit of a hornet's nest here. Ooh, <laughs> that's very brave of you. You know how my week <laughs> yeah. is going, so just be warned. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was more because I know how much a lot of people hated the last seasons of, of Game of Thrones. Oh, right. But I just wanted to mention that actually one of the things that I found done very well, despite all the hating that goes on on the internet, <laughs> yeah. is just the uh, the very, very last episode. Mm-hmm. Um in the, I, I can't remember anymore. It's quite a while since I watched, but maybe it's like the last fifteen minutes or t- ten minutes, something like that. But that's actually where you have the wrap up, yes. and you get to see every single of the one of the important characters and what's they what's going to happen to them, and and how do their life sort of continue from there. And I think that part in itself, whether you like the season or not, doesn't matter. But those ten minutes, fifteen minutes, however long that was, I can't remember, but that wrap up they did there in the in the end, I thought that was done very very nicely. Yes, it was not too drawn out. It was to the point. It just gave you the insight of what's going to happen with these characters and finish things off in a good way. Because the worst way you can finish up, well, this was a TV series then, but even even novels, you know, when things are just left hanging, you have no idea what happened to these people then. Yeah, that that's really not a very satisfactory ending. Um, even though you might have had the most awesome battle just before. But if you then just leave everybody hanging that, yeah, okay, he defeated the the mad, the mad necromancer. And then, uh, yeah, that was cool. Thanks, bye. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's okay. not working very well. And especially if you do have any subplots that weren't tied up and, you know, you see, you always had that reader raising the hand, but what about he defeated the necromancer, but he never picked up the drop jewel that, you know, is going to potentially blow up. And, you know, you want to see those things. You want to know it's either going to be another book or you want to know if it's really a happily ever after are they married, are they going to, you know, have kids, even Harry Potter. I mean, it had that little glimpse forward where he's sending his kids off to Hogwarts. Those are those little moments that you're like, oh, you know, whatever happens, the world goes on. They have a future. And it kind of gives that reader the idea that, oh, I I like that. I like knowing that they're going to be okay. You can let that go now. Yeah, and the end of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo mm-hmm. also returns to the Shire. Oh, no, maybe he doesn't. No, I can't remember anymore. But <laughs> the, the, there is a return to the Shire uh, yes. to see how things are going. And Frodo leaves on the Elven boat. I can't remember if he goes to the Shire first or on, and then leaves on the Elven boat. And I, I can't remember, actually, to be honest. But, uh, but anyway, you do go back to the Shire and uh, you do also see what happens with Frodo afterwards. Yes. Which, again, again it's a good wrap-up. It shows the life of the character what what's gonna happen next and and it doesn't well it should not be drawn out uh, mm-hmm. at all it should be a fairly short phase 
um, but you can tell a lot in a few paragraphs even Absolutely. Uh, or like like my game of thrones example from, from before they probably visited like 10 characters in 10 minutes or something <laughs> uh, but it, it can, and it was nice it was you don't need more no, I um, think I'm definitely one of the authors. I always mean to do a longer wrap up, but I tend to get even for the end of a series, like two chapters. But you, like you said, you can do a lot. For me, it's often it takes two chapters because maybe I switch point of view or something. But you can wrap up some stuff. And if you're building to the next book, this is where you do it. You have a little moment of, oh, thank goodness. And then someone's like, but what about that gem that everyone dropped and got lost and the dragon ate it? And you're like, oh. And then the novel ends, and of course the reader's like, okay, what about that? And they go get the next one. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. So I wanted to mention as well, when we're talking about um, these uh, seven steps of, of story structure, if you would like to have a bit of graphics to go along with the, each of the steps, you can actually go on to the Am Writing Fantasy YouTube channel mm. because we do have a video on there that was recorded, I don't know, a couple of years ago probably by now. Uh, but Autumn goes through the seven steps there as well. And there's a bit of graphics on the screen, screen there, screen, <laughs> on the screen <laughs> to, uh, to guide you so that it, it, it's even easier to follow or even if, if you need even more than that, you can also uh, go and pick up our plotting book because it's built on this structure. And it explains, of course, in a lot more detail that we can do here oh. exactly how to build every single one of those steps and what you need to put into them. So we'll put a link to the plotting book in the show notes. Yeah. So you can, uh, you can go and, uh, and check that one out if, if you need that guidance. But uh, and even a starting better. point could also the video if yeah. you want. The video is good, but the, it's even better that the plotting book really links in the character building and the character arc and how the character is really the one who's driving these seven steps. So definitely check that out if you have questions or if this sounded like, hey, this is how I want to write. Because like I said, this, this is how I write. It makes so much sense. And I I never fall in the middle. I usually fall in the climax because there's so much going on. If I don't add at least two chapters to every climax I write, it would be... <laughs> It will be a first. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, we try to keep it, um, let's say, simple enough that it, it's yes. easy to follow in, on an audio um, podcast like this. Uh, but there are means uh, to get more details, both from the video, but also from the uh, book on plotting if, uh, if you need that. So next Monday, we will discuss how to make the most of Goodreads as an author. Is it useful, uh, a useful site for book marketing? So tune in and find out. If you like what you just heard, there's a few things you can do to support the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. Please tell a fellow author about the show and visit us at Apple Podcast and leave a rating and review. You can also join Autumn and Jasper on patreon.com slash amwritingfantasy. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll get awesome rewards and keep the Am Writing Fantasy podcast going. Stay safe out there and see you next Monday.